Yeah, good evening, everybody. And uh, let us start with the uh, discussion on the genetics of type 2 diabetes. So like coming from the, like a transition from the global healthcare to the real basic sciences like genetics and the hardcore research topic. So uh, I'll try to make it as simple as possible. So, uh, so as we all know, like diabetes is uh, known as a distinct disease for the last 2000 years. In 1935, uh, henceforth established that there are two distinct types, type 1 and type 2. And type 2 is the most common and the fastest growing diseases. Uh, the estimated worldwide prevalence uh, is 700 million by 2045. Uh, it's an interaction between the environmental factors and there's a strong hereditary component. The various environmental factors like obesity, sedentary lifestyle, stress uh, are contributing to type 2 diabetes, but we will focus on the genetic component of type 2 diabetes today. Uh, uh, the hereditary component ranges from like 20 to 80 percent and the evidence comes from large uh, studies from population family and twin based studies the lifetime risk is 40 percent when one of the parent is diabetic and 70 percent if both the parents are affected first degree relatives have three times increased risk of having type 2 diabetes the concordance rate in monozygotic twins is 70 percent and in diazygotic twins is 20 to 30 percent uh, this familial clustering is not entirely due to genetic factors. There is something called as epigenetic processes too. Uh, so what is this epigenetics? Like um, if you see the whole gene, there are the coding regions and there are the non-coding regions. In the non-coding regions, there are some other like genetic functions such as DNA methylation, uh, histone acetylation and non-coding RNAs. If there are changes in any of these functions of the gene, they can also be inherited to one or several generations without having a change in the nucleotide sequence. So this is what is called as epigenetics. Uh, the classical example is the maternal environment and the early infancy. Infants who are born small for gestational age, they have an increased risk for obesity and type 2 diabetes when they grow as adults. So it is all because of the epigenetic changes which occur during the intrauterine life rather, rather than the inherited variations in the DNA sequence. Uh, epigenetics can be used in future also for, uh, like in research for uh, like uh, genome-wide DNA methylation studies can be done and uh, it can help to identify the novel genes in the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. So let us like focus on the main topic for today which is the genetics of type 2 diabetes. So the genetic architecture. Uh, type 2 diabetes is a polygenic disorder and there is a complex interaction between multiple genes and the environment. Uh, unlike type 1 diabetes, where the entire genetic risk is concentrated in HLA region, in type 2 diabetes, this is not the case. It is not concentrated in one region, rather the, there are multiple genes which are scattered all across the genome. Uh, the monogenic diabetes of the young or MODI, it, is, it constitutes less than 5% of the not autoimmune diabetes and it is due to single gene mutations in hepatocyte nuclear factor 1A and glucokinase. Uh, now, how to identify the various diabetic genes? Like there are three main types of studies, the linkage studies, candidate gene studies, and the genome-wide association studies. So let's discuss first for the linkage studies. Uh, what is the meaning of linkage studies? So linkage means that the two uh, genes, they are so close to each other on a chromosome that they tend to inherit together. They tend to go together to the next generation. So, uh, so they are linked together. So uh, this is what uh, are studied like in the genome. So it is successful in detecting the rare variants of large effect like single gene disorders, but it is not so successful in identifying genes in complex poly polygenic disorders. However, in type 2 diabetes, two genes have been uh, found to be associated uh, for type 2 diabetes, which are calpain 10 and transcription factor 7 like 2 gene. Uh, the calpain 10 is the first type 2 diabetic gene which has ever been discovered by linkage analysis in 1996. It is located on chromosome 2 and initially the locus was labeled as NIDDM, but eventually in 2000, the causative gene was finally identified as CAP10. It encodes a cysteine protease and it has a role in intracellular functioning, intracellular remodeling and post-receptor signaling. The TCF7L2, this is the most common type 2 diabetic gene. Uh, it is situated on chromosome number 10 and it was first discovered in Mexican American population. Later, it was mapped to the Icelandic population and it was confirmed in US and Danish cohorts. The associations uh, strongly confirmed, uh, uh, this association was confirmed in the genome-wide association studies in different ethnicities. 
दिस इज द मोस्ट स्ट्रॉन्गली एसोसिएटेड टाइप टू डायबिटिक रिस्क जीन वी बी डिस्कसिंग फर्दर अबाउट टी सी एफ सेवन एल टू जीन इन द जीनोम वाइड स्टडीज कमिंग टू द कैंडिडेट जीन स्टडीज सो इन दी इन दिस काइंड ऑफ स्टडीज द द पोटेंशियल pathways the potential genes and the potential pathways they are studied in more detail which we already know like they are studied in more depth in more detail so the genes which are already suspected in the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes they are studied through focused sequencing efforts and uh, the genes like which are involved in glucose metabolism insulin secretion insulin receptors post receptor signaling and lipid metabolism so we know that these are the pathways which are involved in the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes and the genes which are involved in these pathways they are studied by the candidate gene studies uh, the genes which were associated with type 2 diabetes uh, they included the peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma the ppar gamma insulin receptor substrate 1 and 2 potassium inwardly rectifying channel is commonly called as the kcnj11 uh, wfs1 the hnf uh, homeo box a uh, b and 4a so uh, first we will discuss about the ppar gamma it encodes the molecular targets for thiazolidine dione which is a commonly used anti diabetic drug at position 12 the proline is replaced by arginine and which increases the risk of diabetes by 20% Uh, however this gene is not found to be very significant in the worldwide prevalence of diabetes the irs1 and 2 gene uh, they encode for the peptides which play a role in the insulin signal transduction and the polymorphisms in this gene result in decreased insulin sensitivity uh, the kcnj11 gene it encodes for the atp sensitive potassium channel and it has an important role in the insulin secretion by the beta cells uh, as we all know the activating mutations of this gene can lead to neonatal diabetes and uh, missense polymorphism in kcn j11 is associated with type 2 diabetes uh, the odds of developing type 2 diabetes is 1.2 in carriers the uh, wfs1 gene it encodes for wolfram n protein and the abnormalities can cause wolfram syndrome which is characterized by diabetes insipidus juvenile diabetes optic atrophy and deafness so this gene is involved in the beta cell function and there are two snps so snps is single nucleotide polymorphisms that one nucleotide is changed and it leads to the whole the change in the genetic function or uh, in the genotype so uh, they are associated with type 2 diabetes the hnf 1a 1b and 4a which are commonly called as the modi genes they are uh, they have a role in development of and metabolic functioning of the liver and the beta cells the variants in these genes that do not lead to uh, modi they are associated with decreased insulin secretion and an increased risk of type 2 diabetes uh, the genome wide association studies uh, so so in the genome wide association studies what they do is uh, a large population a large cohort uh, and the whole genome sequencing is done for a large population and in that the various snps which are related to a particular disease they are studied all across the genome so we just get a a full idea uh, of complete idea of the whole genome and the snps for a particular disease in a large population so with the help of high throughput snp genotyping technology it is now possible to scan hundreds of thousands of snps uh that were linked in linkage disequilibrium with millions of snps across the genome so basically we can study the entire genome and in related to and a particular disease the most important gene which was associated for type 2 diabetes is tcf7 l2 which was initially identified by linkage studies and now it was confirmed by the uh, genome wide association studies also uh, they also help to identify the scores of other genetic loci which appear to be linked to type 2 diabetes uh the tcf7 l2 uh this is the most significant and consistent replicated gene for type 2 diabetes so like we say like for modi we know that it is hnf uh, 1a 1b so we know modi is that type 1 means hla so type 2 as of now uh, the most consistent gene is tcf7 l2 it was initially discovered by linkage studies and then by a, uh, it was confirmed by sladek et al in a french population by uh, genome wide association studies the landmark study which is the welcome trust study which comprised 2000 individuals with type 2 diabetes and 3000 controls uh, they also found that tcf7 l2 is the most robust type 2 diabetic signal and the odds ratio of developing uh, diabetes for carriers was 1.36 
uh, this finding was then replicated in almost every human population which was studied and this remains the most robust type 2 diabetic gene identified till date uh, in general the carriers have a odds ratio of 1.4 and homozygotes an odds ratio of 2.5 of having diabetes uh, so it ha it has a, it encodes for a transcription factor which is a member of the wnt signaling pathway and is known to be active in the beta cells uh, the risk allele is present in the intron 3 uh, the t uh, so what does it do? It decreases the insulin secretion from the beta cells, perhaps by altering the action of incretins. It decreases the insulin sensitivity also in the target tissues like adipose tissue. Uh, there is a recent uh, study on the on the mouse uh, in which the uh, TCF seven L two knocked out mice in the liver cells. They had hypoglycemia, and the overexpression led to hyperglycemia. And this effect was not seen when it was done on the beta cells. So that means liver is an important site where this gene, uh, it influences the glucose me metabolism. So uh, like in the glucose mediated insulin release. So if the TCF7 L2 is there, it will cause hyperglycemia. If it is not there, it will cause hypoglycemia. This was like a recent study, which was done by, a, I think, a Japanese group. Uh, then TCF7 L2 uh, has a final, finally it has got a role in cancer as well as in diabetes. So the discovery of this association of cancer and diabetes through this gene has opened a whole new avenue of research for the scientists and researchers all across. Uh, other genes like HHEX, it was identified in both Caucasian and Asian populations. It was located on chromosome number 10, member of homeobox family, and it is also involved in the WNT signaling pathway. It has an odds ratio of developing 1.5 for type 2 diabetes. The other gene is SLC30A8. It encodes, uh, so this also is important for the insulin secretion and present on islands of Langerhans. Interestingly, also seen in type 1 diabetes. Then the CDK, and uh, this gene is on chromosome 9, and it is, uh, it is important for tumor suppression also. Uh, it has a role in insulin secretion. Then the IGF2BP, so these are like various genes which are associated with diabetes and studied by the genome-wide association study. So uh, this is, these are the various genes and the ones which I have highlighted, they are the, they are the significant ones. And if we see like the TCF7L2, the odds ratio is the highest 1.37 uh, out of all the genes which have been studied by the uh, genome-wide association studies. So what do these genes do? They basically they, uh, decrease the beta cell function, which is a final step in the path of diabetes. It causes insulin insensitivity. Uh, from 37,000 individuals where the indices of beta cell function, HOMA-B, and the insulin sensitivity, that is HOMA-IR, were derived. And uh, the risk alleles at 10 loci, uh, they showed significantly reduced beta cell function and at three uh, loci showed reduced insulin sensitivity. So basically these, they, these genes they do two things. One is that cause a beta cell dysfunction. Another thing is they cause insulin insensitivity. Uh, they're also linked to dyslipidemia, atherosclerotic heart disease and cancer. So there are various gene environment interactions other than the uh, direct effect on the insulin. And that is, uh, the proof is like the epidemics of obesity and type 2 diabetes, they are almost like parallel to each other. Uh, so how can we predict the risk of diabetes based on this genetic information? So uh, this is done basic, basically by the cluster analysis. The clustering analysis it can be done either by the clinical and the lab laboratory data or also through the genetic data. So the pre, uh, six pre-selected variables which were used in the clustering, uh, clustering analysis were the GAD antibodies, age at the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, uh, BMI, HbA1c, HOMA2 beta and HOMA2 IR. So uh, using this, like um, it was clustered in like three categories, the uh, the decrease in the beta cell function and the genes responsible were H and HNF1A, SLC30A8, and KCNJ11. The mixed uh, path pathology, like the decrease in the beta cell function and insulin resistance was seen in PAM and RREB1. And the insulin resistance was uh, seen with the genes uh, when the genes were like KLF14, FAM13A. So it also, like when the phenotypic studies were done, it was found that they cause increase in the coronary artery disease, increase in the diabetic kidney disease, and increase in hypertension. So this is how like the various, the clustering was done using the various clinical and the genetic information. Uh, what are the caveats using clustering approach? 
like uh, first the clinical data is not a static one it is strongly influenced by the environment a person who starts doing exercise and lifestyle modifications uh, the clinical data will will change and another issue is like which variables we should include in the model for cluster building so so to overcome that the genetic model has got some advantages because it includes the variants variants which are from the genome wide association studies and already they have uh, seen there is a significant association with type 2 diabetes and it does not vary with time or environment uh, so therefore it can be used at any point of time in life to understand the complex diseases like type 2 diabetes so uh, this is a pictorial uh, representation of how the clusters look like so uh, the ones with decrease in insulin uh, like these are the genes hnf1 a kcnj11 so if we know like these are the genes the pathology is decrease in the insulin secretion and uh, we have to treat accordingly so if there is like mixed decrease in insulin and increase in, in insulin resistance then pam and rrb1 are the genes then uh, at the insulin resistance if it is more than we know it is uh, the other mechanisms like uh, altered lipid metabolism lipodystrophy like phenotype or obesity adiposity we will be discussing more uh, detail uh, of all these things so soft hierarchical uh, clustering approach it was uh, first uh, proposed by adler et al to overcome the clinical heterogeneity in the pathogenesis of complex disease so in this method the each genetic variant it can belong to more than one cluster of cl clinical phenotypes so therefore it will overcome the pleiotropic effect of the genes for example like there are genes which are responsible for both obesity and insulin secretion which can contribute to type 2 diabetes so each gene can be can belong to more than one cluster of clinical phenotypes uh, the polygenic risk score uh, they help in predicting the risk for type 2 diabetes so uh, it was like this is another tool for uh, predicting the risk for uh, for diabetes so first one was uh, this was uh, established by vidon et al it is uh, about the restricted polygenic risk score in which three variants of the candidate genes were used kcnj11 the ppar gamma and the tcf7 l2 so there is a, a limitation with this kind of uh, scoring system uh, in the prognosis of the disease in uh, because it is using only three variants so uh, to overcome that khera et al they recently constructed a global polygenic risk score in which they used all the variants across the genome and in recent years uh, the partition polygenic risk score to identify the patients at high risk for diabetes through a specific intermediate phenotype pathways were used uh so uh, so the various pathways like the phenotypic pathways like obesity uh, lipodystrophy and uh, how they are progressing to type 2 diabetes they were used for uh, partition polygenic risk score so global polygenic risk score is uh, by using the bioinformatic machine learning tool and uh, uh, the gene genetic inheritance patterns by linkage disequilibrium in european ancestry populations uh, they created this gprs and it includes all the variation variants in the genome and it was found that the participants in the top 5% of the gprs distribution had 2.75.2.75 uh, times increased increased chances of developing type 2 diabetes as compared to the rest of the 95 population this is very close to the mo monogenic diabetes so it is very specific and can be helpful in deciding the precision medicine so this is how the various uh, scoring system looks like so if we see first the genome wide association plots so uh, in this like all the the whole sequence whole genome sequencing of uh, of across the population is done so it includes all the genes uh, however in the restricted uh, polygenic risk score only three uh, genes are studied and the scoring system is developed based on the uh, based on these three genes whether the patient will develop type 2 diabetes or not in global polygenic risk, uh, uh, scoring system all the variants uh, across the genome was uh, is used in the global uh, system and uh, this the the most advanced is the partition polygenic uh, risk scoring system in which Uh, the genes which are involved in the various intermediate pathways involved in the uh, pathogenesis of the disease they are uh, studied so like uh, these are the genes which are involved in pathway 1 that is the uh, beta cell dysfunction Uh, the pathway two, there will be a decreased. Uh, so this is like when uh, in the insulin and dec is decreased. Uh, so these are the uh, genes which are involved in this pathway. And uh, in pathway three, the mixed uh, decrease in the insulin, beta cell function, and insulin resistant genes are uh, are involved. In pathway four, 
in the in this partition there is the genes which are responsible for nafld and lipid metabolism are involved in this pathway the genes for uh, lipodystrophy are involved and uh, in the final pathway the obesity and adiposity genes are uh, are, are there so uh, in soft clustering uh, method will allow the assignment of one gene to multiple phenotypes so one gene can be present in multiple phenotypes like we can see here so uh, so with the help of this partition polygenic risk score uh, mccarthy proposed the pellet model so in this the focus is not on the end phenotype of type 2 diabetes but rather on the various intermediate phenotypes like obesity lipodystrophy nafld and insulin deficiency so uh, uh, so each intermediate pathway is visualized by a primary color and uh, calculating the then the then it is calculate the partial uh, the uh, the partition polygenic risk score is calculated for each intermediate phenotype uh, then these colors are combined and individuals risk of type 2 diabetes is calculated and accordingly the targeted therapy can be given so for example in the first patient who has who is 50 years old male with a bmi of 45 with hypertension and hyperlipidemia this is the partition polygenic risk so the red color shows the obesity the genes for obesity the yellow is for the lipodystrophy blue is for the insulin deficiency and pink is for the nafld so in this patient the the in the partition uh, genetic risk we for uh, there is like the red color is more or the genes which are for the obesity are more so the pellet will mix the colors and it will be like predominantly for obesity and less for other uh, phenotypes so we know like in this patient probably the targeted therapy with uh glp1 receptor agonist and weight loss with the concurrent treatment of type 2 diabetes will be more helpful so we can give a targeted or a precise therapy for for the, can be given to this patient uh for this patient who is 35 years old woman with bmi of 19 and a phenotype of primary lipodystrophy with the genes the the genotype of lipodystrophy genes so we know how to treat the patient uh, accordingly by treating the underlying lipid disorders for 26 year old male with a bmi of 25 and the predominant uh, genotype is this blue color which is primary insulin deficiency uh, which uh, a trial of sulfonylureas will be uh, the best uh, option probably in this patient as we do in monogenic uh, diabetes in 44 year old female with a bmi of 32 and an fld with uh, with the pink color means like the there is the primary Uh, an FLD or the lipid metabolism cluster. So the trial of GLP-1 receptor agonist and weight loss will be the uh, good option for this patient. So the use of polygenic risk score in clinical use it is quite limited right now. However, in research and clinical trials it has been used successfully. So uh, so it's mostly like a research tool as of now. So, uh, so in one study by Lee et al. the restricted uh, polygenic risk score it showed the patients with higher genetic risk score had a greater reduction in hbmc in response to sulfonylureas jiang et al similarly showed that with each increase in standard deviation of the score uh, the risk of developing insulin de uh, dependence increased by 7% uh, wagner et al they so they showed by using the global uh, the gprs uh, that increased pancreatic steatosis was associated with decreased insulin secretion and using a partition polygenic risk score for lipodystrophy uh, they showed that despite having the lower bmi or the waist circumference those with higher lipodystrophy uh, score they had significantly higher insulin resistance and ldl uh, uh, and uh, ldl causing increased cvd risk so there are some other uh, genetic tools which are uh, which have been uh, in used in research uh mostly so one is the co localization technique uh, in this the in co localization the signal from the type 2 diabetes uh, genome wide association study and the expression quantitative trait loci in a diabetes relevant tissue such as pancreatic islets they are studied and they find an evidence for potential causal link so in co localization like this is the gene uh, the genome wide association study uh, the genes are plotted and the qtl association is plotted and then the co-localization analysis is done if the genes are non co-localizing then they are expressed separately like gene x and, and the disease gene they are expressing separately like two independent variants but if they are co-localized it then the gene x and the disease causing gene they are uh, they are 
uh, expressing as a single variant so there is some sort of uh, causal uh, association uh, between the two genes so this is basically for understanding the pathogenesis of the disease and understanding the various targets which can be potential targets which can be used for the treatment and therapies another tool is the mendelin uh, randomization which is for the validation and identification of potential drug targets it's a very strong technique it's a very powerful technique uh, in which the because like there is a random assortment, assortment of alleles during meiosis and uh, this helps in assessing the potential cause uh, causality between the snp and the outcome so it is used to uh, it was already been used to demonstrate the causal link between hyperglycemia and cvd risk uh, the best example is the pcsk9 inhibitors in 2005 kohan it uh, all they identified like there were two nonsense mutations in pcsk9 which resulted in drastically lowered ldl and this led to the development of pcsk9 inhibitors so if the allele was absent it led to a decrease in the ldl cholesterol if the allele was present it led to the increase in the uh, ldl cholesterol another tool is the phenome wide association studies uh this these are studies which help in identifying the the drug repurposing basically so uh this is different from the this is like opposite invert of the genome wide association study in which a single snp is tested for association with multiple phenotypes so the various off target effects of the drugs can be studied uh, this is a very good tool for uh, doing the drug repurposing purposing and to identify the various adverse effects of the drug the best example is tocilizumab which is an interleukin 6 receptor antagonist used in giant cell arthritis but it has a complication of aortic aneurysm so this this is like how we can explain about the phenome wide association study let us for example this is gene x and this gene x when the phenome wide association study is done and the graph is plotted using icd10 codes so this drug is primarily uh, used for rheumatoid arthritis that is the original target of this drug but by doing the phenome wide association studies it was found that uh, that this gene x it has uh, an off target effect on the uh, cardiovascular disease and also on type 2 diabetes it also has an adverse drug reaction uh, which is uh, which is bacterial sepsis which was associated with gene x so after when we know this like uh, this drug Uh, which has uh, which can be a potential uh, has a potential target on other diseases so then this this drug which is already there being used on in some other disease can be tested and tried in uh, other disease and can be used for drug repurposing and we can identify the adverse drug reactions also using this technique uh so the future directions for research uh, is precision medicine so Uh, the it can it is helpful for uh, risk stratifying the patients it can be uh, done it can be used for asymptomatic patients or asymptomatic people who are at risk of developing type 2 diabetes their genetic risk can be scored and uh, interventions can be done with the help of intensive lifestyle modifications medications etc to the onset of the disease type 2 diabetes is done it will mirror almost like that of monogenic diabetes where specific therapies are tailored to the genotype uh just a little bit about metabolics and proteomics it's a vast field but like we will be it's the major research is only about the branched amino acids and type 2 diabetes risk the the increased level of branched amino acids in uh, it's positively correlated with insulin resistance and there is a 2 to 3.5 times increased risk of type 2 diabetes with higher uh, branched amino acids level so conclusions the uh, clustering method allows us uh, for more precise subtyping of type 2 diabetes and increased understanding of the pathophysiology of a complex disease uh, the genetic methodologies uh, they offer a wealth of information for a specific patient from a single peripheral blood draw the use of partitioned uh, polygenic risk score has the potential to identify patients at high risk for specific intermediate phenotypes for type 2 diabetes leading to the uh, A earlier implementation of interventions and further work is needed to elucidate and demonstrate the clinical utility of germline genotyping and the partition polygenic risk score in type 2 diabetes so disentangling the type 2 diabetes pathogenic mechanisms so uh, currently we are treating type 2 diabetes as a homogeneous entity uh, despite there are various pathological mechanisms like obesity beta cell failure lipodystrophy non alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease uh, so th- we are treating the end phenotype the final phenotype however using the partition polygenic risk score it can identify the proportion of the genetic risk due to each intermediate pathway like obesity beta cell failure lipodystrophy and nfld 
and then in future uh, what can be done to implement it clinically first is like we need to do more uh, randomization and the real world trials and then a differential approach to treatment based on the uh, PPRS pathway mechanism. So basically, uh, the aim is to prescribe the most precise medicine to the patient. Yeah, thank you for your patient listening.